This episode of the Gondrepreneur Podcast is made possible by 420 friendly service providers in the Gondrepreneur Business Directory. If you need professional help with your business, from accounting to legal services to consulting, marketing, payment processing, or insurance, visit gondrepreneur.com slash businesses to find service providers who specialize in helping cannabis entrepreneurs like you. Visit the Gondrepreneur Business Directory today at gondrepreneur.com slash businesses. Hey there, I'm your host, T.G. Brandfault, and thank you for listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of gondrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Today, I'm joined by Jonathan Menkis. He's a California-based trademark attorney with Knob Martins. Uh, Jonathan's practice includes domestic and foreign trademark selection and clearance, trademark audits, unfair competition, false advertising, and notice and takedown procedures involving copyright and trademark claims. How are you doing this morning, Jonathan? I'm doing terrific. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm delighted, man. I love having, uh, you know, attorneys and lawyers, uh, you know, very uh, bright specialists on the show. So, uh, you know, this isn't something that that we've uh, discussed before. But before we get into sort of your expertise uh, on trademark law, um, tell me about yourself, your background. How would you end up serving cannabis clients? Great question. Uh, it, it's it's fairly interesting because I represent a number of clients in different industries, fashion and clothing, food and beverage, medical devices, among many others. And uh, one day, a few years ago, I had a dispensary locator service a client that needed our assistance with trademarks and brand protection. And it just so happens that company was Weed Maps, uh, which you may have heard of. Uh, and frankly, it, it just was a snowball effect from there where once you represent uh, one player in the industry, uh, your name gets out there, word gets out, hopefully you do a good job for people and they appreciate that. And, uh, and then they just start calling or emailing. And so it's, it's been fantastic. So that's been a few years now uh, since I got that first call, but uh, it's just been uh, a fantastic journey ever since. So it's, it doesn't sound like something that you went to law school sort of in the back of your mind that you wanted to serve this space. What interested you most uh, about this sector? It's a great question. And uh, on that point, I might just note, it, it seems uh, law schools nowadays are beginning to offer cannabis classes. I didn't have such a class offered when I was uh, ta taking uh, classes back in law school way back when. Uh, but uh, it's... It's so interesting to me because there's so much unknown. I, certainly, we know trademarks and we know it very well, but uh, there are certain unique aspects of uh, trademarks in the cannabis and CBD space that aren't present in other industries. And I'm sure we'll get into that later, but the uh, nuances, the gray areas, uh, it's all very exciting because there are very little uh, answers and lots of questions. And it's really enjoyable for me as a practitioner to work with clients, figure out where they are in the space. Do they have an established trademark portfolio? Are they just beginning and work with them through that journey? And uh, that's what's most exciting to me is walking with them, uh, figuring this out as we go. Uh, like I said, we, there are certain things we know for sure in, in trademark law, certain uh, standards, if you will, but there's so much unknown that uh, that's where I think it's most interesting to me. So you mentioned that they don't teach cannabis in law schools. This is, uh, you know, something that is also the case in, in medical schools and other really sort of advanced uh, education systems. What do you think it's going to take to bring these classes sort of to to the masses, if you will? It's a great question. And I think we're just starting to see this happen. Uh, I met with a professor from UCI School of Law who does offer a cannabis uh, class to his law students. And uh, I don't know how many law schools out there are, are offering such a unique program, but I think because of the, the interest, it's just uh, remarkable uh, how 
how much interest this space generates. And I, I think even before we get to federal legalization or perhaps decriminalization, uh, more and more people are going to be interested and that will drive more and more universities, I believe, to offering more courses and curriculum in this space. So, so tell me about some of the cannabis trademark cases. You know, the Tapatio case comes to mind. The Gorilla Glue case comes to mind. Both uh, dealt with trademark issues. Uh, one was mo a little more focused on uh, the the image, the Tapatio, uh, the copyright image there. Uh, what, but tell me more about what were the issues with with these cases and what were the results? Certainly. So we'll start with Tapatio, and I know uh, I have to give a shameless shout out to uh, one of my colleagues, uh, or two of my colleagues, Jonathan Hyman, Victoria Ellis, they wrote a fantastic article uh, stirring the pot recent trademark infringement claims by or from major brands in the cannabis field. Uh, and I would just point people to that very succinct and uh, wonderful read. And it does show the images in question for the Tapatio and Trapatio hot sauce as an issue. But with that shameless plug uh, aside, uh, the case really involved uh, people being too cute and too close to uh, the well-known uh, Tapatio branding and the imagery, as you pointed out. And so uh, the first lawsuit was filed against Smoker's Paradise and More Inc. Uh, it was a design mark that looked strikingly similar to Tapatio's hot sauce and uh, Tapatio did not find the joke very funny at all. Uh, and so they filed for trademark infringement and trademark dilution uh, by tarnishment, which I'm sure we'll go into in a bit. Uh, and they also filed a second lawsuit against TCG Industries uh, for offering THC infused hot sauce under the mark Trapatio. Uh, and their similar claims were asserted as far as trademark infringement, unfair competition and dilution. Uh, and uh, it, it's a big deal. I think if there's one takeaway from that particular case is that being cute doesn't mean it's okay to do. Uh, certainly defending a federal lawsuit uh, is not inexpensive and it's not a quick process. And uh, I think the take home there for, for my clients and for many clients is that you really have to be careful when you're adopting a brand. You really shouldn't be looking at uh, well-known brands. I know uh, the Girl Scouts, uh, cookies have filed a number of complaints, if not sending cease and desist letters. Uh, Hershey's is very protective of their brand. And so it's far better to use your money and resources in coming up with a unique brand on your own that doesn't look anything like an established brand for a non-cannabis company because the results uh, otherwise might end up in a lawsuit. <laughs> So, so what was the result there? Did, did uh, I, I, I saw some images that, you know, the Trapatio, they, they took away the sombrero um, and that still wasn't enough. And so what, what happened, in, so there were two different complaints, complaints. And so with the second one, the one that I mentioned, TCG Industries uh, there, it was interesting because they had a settlement agreement previously entered into. Uh, and then when uh, TCG Industries allegedly reached out to Tapatio to say, We've got this new mark and logo. Is it okay for us to use this? Uh, Tapatio declined. Uh, TCG Industries went forward uh, and then the lawsuit uh, resulted there. I, I don't know where they are in the stages of the lawsuit, whether it's still pending. Uh, my, my sense is that uh, these cases tend to settle. Uh, they don't tend to go very far, but even uh, working on settlement can itself be a very expensive process. Um, as far as Gorilla Glue, uh, their uh, settlement agreement was reached. My understanding is there, there was no monetary payment uh, as part of the settlement. Uh, however, uh, Gorilla Glue, the name Gorilla Glue had to be changed uh, to something else. For instance, um, uh, I think it was GG Strains or there's some other uh, mark there that they had to use that didn't incorporate Gorilla Glue. That It had to be some other unique name. So what I, 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 I remember writing about this when it was happening, the, both of these cases, and what struck me sort of about the Gorilla Glue case was that there, there were no images uh, being used and that you can't really trademark a strain name, but you can. Um, can. Can you sort of walk me through that confusion? S certainly. So uh, strain names can... You can, in theory, have a trademark for a strain name. So uh, a strain, any product 
that you have out there, a t-shirt, medical device, all of these, if you have uh, a trademark, which identifies the goods or services of your company from those of another, it serves as a trademark. And the tricky part is twofold. One is if you pick a trademark that is confusingly similar or if not identical to a well-known brand, then you can't do that under trademark law. That's not permitted. The second is if uh, someone in particular, or rather everybody refers to a, a, a type of product uh, at, with a specific term. So what do I mean by that? Uh, if you have headphones, if you're a, head, you, you, you're a producer of headphones, uh, let's say they happen to be wireless. You can't come up with wireless headphones as the name of your quote trademark because that's the generic name for what the product does or is. It has a feature. Uh, and so if people refer to wireless headphones, they don't think of any one brand. They think it's just the type of product that it is. Uh, it, by contrast, if you have Bose headphones or Apple earbuds or something that is a, a trademark, a source identifier, uh, that's where you have trademark protection. So to the same extent with strain names, I, I can see a situation where uh, a person comes up with a specific strain, uh, they protect it and consumers understand that perhaps it comes from one specific source, but if it does not come from a specific source, if many people are producing it, uh, there's really no policing going on by the, the brand owner, then it's really open to the public and it's become what, what we call in trademark parlance, a generic term. So let, let's, let's stick on Gorilla Glue for a second. Um, you know, there's a sort of a lot of uh, discrepancy within the space about, you know, about calling strains Gorilla Glue, say, in Oregon compared to California, right? You know, they, they say that they might call it Gorilla Glue, but it doesn't have the same sort of genetic makeup. So how do you go about proving that uh, you have the, the, the actual product uh, when it comes to strain names? And so that, that raises an interesting que question, rather, of uh, consumer deception, right? If, if, if a consumer assumes that a certain product has a certain makeup or, or if it, it's a strain name and it, it creates a certain uh, feeling when, when used, uh, then that's one thing. But then if you, if you call it, let's, I, I guess Gorilla Glue might not be the best example because it's the, the trademark owner's name, but if you call it something else and it doesn't have those qualities, that seems to be a different uh, problematic use where the consumer has an expectation that it has certain qualities or characteristics when it doesn't, it, it's sort of a, a, a type of fraud, if you will, uh, unfair competition. A number of states have their own unfair competition laws and trademark law does allow for that where you're unfairly claiming to have a product that has or bears certain characteristics when in fact it does not. Okay, so why don't you tell me about a couple of the cases that, that you've worked on, you know, uh, sort of walk me through uh, maybe something that, that you've defended or, or the process of trademarking something. Uh, certainly. So uh, one, one of the projects or types of projects that I, I come across with uh, some regularity is someone comes up with a brand name. Uh, it doesn't have to be for a product. Oftentimes it's uh, a clothing line or uh, they have stickers or decals that promote the particular brand in question. And so one of my tasks is to see is someone else using a similar trademark uh, for similar products or services and uh, doing what we call a clearance search. And so you look at uh, various databases. They have third, We have third-party databases that we commission to review searches and we see, okay, this other party is in this different space. We we either do or do not think it's going to cause an issue down the road. And then we counsel our clients on uh, the results of that, whether they should move forward, maybe they should add a few other terms to the trademark uh, to distinguish it so they uh, reduce the risk that uh, they will see an issue going forward. So that, that's one type in the trademark space. Uh, separately in the copyright space, which uh, hopefully we'll get to chat about that a bit, uh, as well as a few other forms of intellectual property that I think every brand owner should be aware of uh, is copyright law. So uh, one project that I, I think is pretty interesting that I've been working on uh, with some of my colleagues as of late is uh, clearing copyrights. So copyrights, unlike trademarks, protect a little bit, uh, it's a different bundle of sticks, if you will. Copyrights prevent copying of imagery, of music, of sounds, 
Uh, it doesn't really matter who's producing it. Uh, it really matters just whether the, the two images or sounds or music in question are, are known as uh, being substantially similar. And uh, the interesting part about copyright law is while it typically prohibits someone from uh, copying it without authorization, there are certain exceptions. You may have heard of the fair use defense. Uh, there can be certain instances under copyright law where uh, using someone else's uh, or clips rather of a video or newspaper or other articles can be deemed a fair use. So you don't need that copyright holder's permission to use it. And uh, that's one project I've been working on is counseling our clients on uh, the situations in which that uh, may or may not be permissible uh, when a license is not feasible. Is this something that is at the forefront when you're dealing with people in the cannabis industry? Is this something that the, that's sort of on the forefront of their mind when they enter the space or, you know, do they have sort of an aha moment when they're talking to you? It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I would say by and large, uh, my clients really value trademarks and brand protection from the get go. I, I, I find myself doing less educating uh, as far as the importance of trademarks and brand protection in the cannabis space as compared with other spaces, interestingly enough. Uh, unfortunately, I think um, there are certain assumptions made about people in this space, but they're, they're some of the brightest, uh, most uh, innovative people I've come across, frankly. And that's going back to your first question is, is why I love this space so much is just how intelligent these people are. They're business folks, they're business savvy. Uh, these are not what I think some might uh, unfortunately view as uh, CD people. They, these are, as I said, business owners that really want to do the right thing, protect the brands, uh, follow the law and, and do what they can to make sure that their company can thrive. And uh, to me, that's been very exciting to work with them, uh, to help them grow their brands uh, in an intelligent way, uh, rather than just uh, let me file uh, whichever trademarks you send my way, I'll file. I don't think that's typically the way uh, these businesses uh, flourish. I think there has to be a targeted approach uh, to trademark protection. And, and that's what I enjoy working with these folks uh, in the cannabis space is helping decide what, what are my most important brands and how do I go about protecting them? So recently, the U.S. Trademark and Patent Office uh, released some guidance um, related to uh, trademark copyright issues in the uh, in the cannabis space. Uh, could you tell me what your take on that guidance was and what it ultimately means for cannabis companies? It's, it's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I think guidance, and I'm using air quotes here, uh, is is pretty unhelpful if you are in the cannabis space. Uh, for instance, if if the product you're working with has more than 0.3% THC, uh, it's effectively out from a trademark registration standpoint. Uh, the trademark office in the guidelines clarified what I think many practitioners already knew, which is that uh, in order to obtain a trademark registration, the use has to be considered lawful. And uh, lawful use requires that uh, it, the use does not violate some other uh, area of law. And what many examiners have been doing, at least as of the last few years, is citing the Controlled Substances Act as a bar against registration of products that either touch uh, cannabis directly, transport it, conceal it, process it, et cetera. Um, I think there are ways that, that these products can uh, be be registered, but it's it's really few and far between, uh, and it, it creates a real challenge for those in the space. If it's if the product contains less than 0.3 percent THC, uh, the guidance made clear that you could still have an issue, uh, not with the Controlled Substances Act, but with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. Uh, and so it seems like uh, you, you, with the Farm Bill passage in December 20th of 2018, we thought uh, a lot of the CBD products would be uh, easily registrable. And we just haven't seen that because now the Trademark Office is looking to at the FTC, the FDA, and finding that uh, such products in particular in the supplement space are simply not registrable. So what about states, you know, what about in California? Can, can companies that are, you know, licensed, legally operating, uh, do they have rights under any state laws? 
It's a terrific question. And that that's really uh, a, a big part of uh, the counseling that we do with our clients is looking at uh, the states where they have legal use within those states and helping them secure state trademark registration. So California, uh, I am I'm very happy to say, has a very robust uh, system in place from filing to registration where they do permit products to be registered, uh, cannabis products, CB products. Uh, a few exceptions there. Uh, it can't, the, the design element or logo cannot be uh, marketed uh, where it would be attractive to children. You can't have products, whether CBD or cannabis, that are uh, mixed with alcohol or contain alcohol in it. So there are, are a few uh, exceptions there. But generally speaking, at least in California, you can secure uh, state trademark registrations for these products, and uh, there are a handful of other jurisdictions that also uh, allow for it. For instance, Oregon, uh, Nevada, uh, Arizona, you can get a registration. I believe that one is only for medical use. But in any event, we do counsel clients uh, in the various states that uh, do allow for state registrations and helping them secure products there. Uh, it, it's very interesting we, that we have this dual system. We have the federal trademark system where you can probably get registrations for clothing, for decals, for things that don't touch the product itself. And then at the state level, you can get it for products um, themselves. So forgive me if, if this is a naive question, but let's say a company in California, you know, has all the state trademarks and then a company uh, in say Massachusetts, right, which has a legal cannabis program uh, violates that trademark. Is, is there any sort of action that the company in California could take against that Massachusetts company under the state guidelines or is it sort of an in-state, uh, would, would the infringement have to happen in-state? I love this question. Uh, I think it's a great one it, and it raises, it, this is not unique to uh, cannabis. You, this, this happens with some regularity. Uh, where you have two companies, Company A in California and we'll say Company B in Massachusetts. Uh, they both started using at different times, but they're pretty localized. What happens? Uh, so we'll assume for purposes of this question, there are no federal trademark registrations, um, which we should talk about at some point why someone should uh, get or at least apply for a federal registration. But in your hypothetical, uh, it's first in right, first in time, excuse me, first in right. So the first person to use the trademark uh, has rights in that jurisdiction or geographic location where they used it. So in your situation, if company A only used them within California and company B only used within Massachusetts, then really they would just be coexisting in their separate markets. There would be no claim from uh, A to B or B to A because they're, they've only used in those local markets. Now it gets tricky when, let's say, Company A has also licensed right to use their trademark in Colorado, uh, and, and the Massachusetts company has also licensed rights to its trademark in Colorado. So then the question might come down to who was the first to use it within Colorado? Uh, you really, it's a complicated issue, but it, it really comes down to who was first to use it in the relevant jurisdiction and, and perhaps a, a small zone outside of that specific locale uh, would would ultimately win. But uh, it's a great question. And I'm really, really happy you asked it. So so you mentioned, you know, that, that people should file, at least file for federal protection. Uh, but earlier you had said that, you know, you're not really going to have a whole lot of luck at the federal level because it's cannabis schedule one, that that whole thing. So, so you know, why make that application uh, if it's going to get denied? Terrific. So I think we need to make a distinction between what we're filing for. And so uh, it can be tricky if you file for a cannabis related product, you're almost certainly not going to get it federally registered. But if you're, you are a brand owner, uh, presumably you have hats, clothing, uh, other paraphernalia, if you will, to support your brand. And that, because it doesn't contain cannabis products, uh, can be registered at the federal level, which is often ideal. And so uh, we counsel our clients in obtaining federal registrations for, as I mentioned, clothing, decals, stickers, uh, lighters, perhaps lanyards, uh, as well as website services. If you're providing a website that has information on perhaps the legalization of cannabis, I, I think I would rather have that than nothing when, when trying to assert it 
against a third party. Uh, and so while we're on the subject of why bother with federal registration, it confers a few uh, important um, uh, things that people should consider. So first is if company A that we talked about uh, in your previous hypothetical files a federal registration, let's say for clothing, let's say they've only used in California and Nevada. Once they secure a registration for that clothing, it's as though they've used in every single state in the US, including Massachusetts, when they have it. And so that's a pretty massive uh, benefit because now they don't have to prove use there. It's presumed that they have already used it there. So that's one benefit. The second benefit is now you have the trademark office acting as uh, a mini police force for you, if you will, because they monitor, well, they, they review every application that comes across their desk and they will look to see if there's some other registration or application uh, that would bar uh, a new application from, from registering. And so you have the added benefit of the trademark office basically adding as a first stop gate uh, with people trying to register marks that are confusingly similar to what, what you own. Uh, and you have certain statutory presumptions uh, with a federal registration that you don't get with without a registration. So for instance, uh, that the mark is valid, that you own it, that it's distinctive. Uh, these are all important features that you would otherwise have to prove in court if you did not have a registration. So I think there's real value there that that uh, that I, most of my clients, I think, uh, appreciate. I'm very fortunate that they appreciate that. And it's very fun to work with them to see what other products we can uh, help them protect. And I don't want to say we like to see how close we can get. That would not be uh, the intent there, but just to see uh, ways in which we can secure brand protection outside of the core products and services. So what about, you know, I know we briefly discussed strain names earlier, but what, how, how do entrepreneurs protect that strain name intellectual property? I mean, I know that you've, you know, you said that you can, you can uh, trademark clothing and, and other things that don't touch the plant, but is there any way to protect intellectual property like strain names? Terrific. So I, uh... I'm really glad you asked this question because it, it does point to the other areas of intellectual property outside of trademarks that are important to consider. Uh, so for instance, uh, patents. Patents uh, traditionally cover uh, useful articles, machines, inventions, improvements thereon, thereupon, and uh, these might, let's say they're atomizers or some other physical product that you have or processes. Uh, you can actually get a patent on strains. And I do have colleagues here at Kenobi uh, that have worked with clients in, uh, in filing for uh, patents on strain names. And so that's certainly something people should look at. I think the big caveat there is that if, if uh, someone has been using or uh, publicly distributing, offering for sale uh, this particular strain name for more than a year, then uh, by and large, it, it would be unlikely to be patented because you basically donated it to the public. I would defer to one of my patent colleagues for further guidance on that, but roughly speaking, uh, if it's been out in the public for more than a year, then uh, you don't have uh, the option of getting a patent on that. But uh, perhaps there are other ways of protecting it. Uh, trade secrets is another thing people should consider. Uh, trade secrets are really anything that derives value from being a secret. Uh, so you think of Coca-Cola, uh, their recipe is probably the oldest uh, trade secret that uh, is, is out there. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, their recipe for chicken uh, is also uh, a pretty famous one we can say. So trade secrets for customer lists, or maybe there's a process by which uh, you, you are growing the plant, or there's some uh, secretive process that you use that you don't want to disclose to others that might be valuable to protect. And so that, that knocks out, we've already discussed trademarks, there's patents, there's trade secrets, and we touched on copyright, which really, uh, I think for purposes of the listeners here would be your website, uh, your packaging material, the logo design, all, all of these things that have an image on them, you should be thinking copyright and the application process is uh, relatively inexpensive. It is inexpensive, frankly. And the process uh, in, the, in the copyright office is unlike the trademark office because the copyright office is agnostic as far as use. So there is no CSA refusal for copyrights. And I think that's probably one of the most undervalued forms of intellectual property is copyrights because uh, the imagery is so important to branding. And I, I do think people should strongly consider uh, 
getting a copyright. And I will say one further point on that. This comes up with uh, regularity in my practice. Uh, I wouldn't use, or at least I'd be careful, I should say, in using a third party to design your logos because uh, more often than not, or at least frequently, uh, even though they they say they're assigning it to you and you own the copyright, again, I'm using air quotes here for own the copyright. When we look at these agreements, uh, oftentimes you don't. You look at it and we have to go back and get a copyright assignment from that third party. Uh, and the reason for that is under copyright law, whoever designs the website or designs the logo is the author or the owner of that. The exception being if it's an employee within uh, a company and it's within the scope of their employment to, to prepare that uh, website or the graphic designs, then the company owns it. But other than that, if it's a third party, uh, traditionally that person owns it or that company outside of your company owns it. And and so that is something I think audience the audience should uh, just keep in mind when um, commissioning someone to prepare the logo design because maybe you don't own the rights when you think you do. So how, how do you prevent that from happening? I mean, do you design it yourself? Do you have a, an attorney to sort of make sure that all the I's and T's are dotted and crossed on, on the contract? Yes, uh, you it, working with uh, competent counsel is always a good thing uh, to consider. I, I think uh, make no assumptions that just because someone says you own the copyright that you in fact do. Uh, it, it, every case is different and, and the facts need to be looked at. And I would say even within a company, it's worthwhile for a practitioner to look at uh, the situation involved there because maybe there's uh, some ambiguity as to whether that what they designed was really within the scope of their employment. So maybe that employee owns it as opposed to the company. So I think you're you're absolutely right. Working with competent counsel to think through, through these issues, to review agreements or to prepare agreements for these brand owners uh, in advance, uh, at least to to consider them thoroughly is really the the uh, point uh, of this exercise. So I want to go back uh, for a second when you were talking about trade secrets. Um, this isn't something that I that I thought about at all uh, with regard to to ways to protect yourself. Um, I'm also not a lawyer, but the what's that process like? How do you file for to protect trade secrets? It's a great question. Uh, and so you technically don't file uh, anything for trade secrets. So it's unlike any other area of intellectual property, as far as patents where you have a filing, copyrights and trademarks where you have a, a filing with the government. Trade secrets, you don't. You, you just have to prove that uh, you have uh, something that is valuable because it is secret, like I said, customer list or perhaps a recipe. And you take reasonable steps to actually keep it secret. If you post it on Instagram, this is exactly how I make X product. You've lost it. You've donated it, it to the public. And so uh, I, I think people need to be careful when uh, they say they have a trade secret. And then if they're sharing it with third parties, uh, non-disclosure agreements are absolutely critical to make sure you haven't just lost or donated your trade secret to the public. So something else about social media. Um... When I I'd, I'd uh, helped a gentleman open up a few head shops a few years ago, and uh, he had named them Dab City, and he actually had gotten a cease and desist from um, an attorney because somebody had opened an Instagram page a couple of years earlier using that Dab City moniker, and they they were claiming that the shop had infringed on. Um, his copyright because he had he had had it longer right via social media is is you know what i guess my question is what when you when you have a social media page when you when you start a social media page uh is that sort of setting some sort of clock as it refers to trademark and copyright that those issues it's a great question and, and uh, i think it does raise uh, a great point in how does social media impact people in the space uh, what are some issues that come up? Uh, I think this this could work both ways. I know I have a number of clients who post images or their brand, or they promote their brand on uh, Instagram, for instance, and it's just how you connect to the to the consumer. Uh, and so I think under traditional trademark law, then that uh, advertisement of products on social media could be deemed uh, in certain circumstances as trademark use. And as we talked about, the first to use it technically has 
the first uh, right or has rights in the trademark there. Uh, but the reverse is also true that uh, you have to be careful when when using social media or uh, when people post things on social media. Uh, who are you? Are you the are you Instagram or are you the brand owner? And I think each party along the chain uh, of command there, so to speak, uh, should, has to be cognizant of what's being posted. Um, for brand owners, I know this happens uh, with m way too much regularity where they file for a product and the trademark examiner will take a look at their website. We never submitted any evidence of their website. We just submitted product packaging, for, for instance, or something else. And the examiner pokes around and sees, oh, you identified something as an herbal product, which sounds innocuous enough, but I see that you're actually selling cannabis because on this Instagram page, there are cannabis leaves everywhere, people smoking. It's very obvious that this is um, uh, for cannabis products. And, and so I think that's where people also have to be careful uh, with, I understand that you need to promote your brand, but just be warned what's out there in the public is out there for everyone, including trademark examiners who will and have used whatever you've posted against you. So this has been really fascinating, um, you know, getting the, the, it sounds really complicated and, and um, you, you learned pretty quickly and on the fly. Um, what has to happen, do you think, uh, federal, statewide to make this issue less complicated? Is it, is it something as simple as sort of federal action uh, or... You know, can something be done maybe when states pass laws that include sort of language that speaks to this issue? How, how can we sort of less muddy these waters? It's a great question. It's an important question. Uh, I, I think if, if uh, cannabis were uh, federally decriminalized or legalized, then uh, I think the trademark practice would be uh, much, much easier than it currently is uh, the trademark office interestingly enough once upon a time did allow products that had cannabis in them i think between 2000 around 2013 or 14 or so uh, you can find registrations where it lists something that uh, is pretty obviously cannabis related and then there was a change in course and so uh, i think the easiest thing to have happen would be federal legalization or decriminalization uh, and the trademark office going along with that saying, okay, well, it's no longer not lawful use in commerce, so we will no longer be refusing registration on that basis. That would certainly make my job easier, but uh, I, I don't know that it's going to happen anytime in the, in the very near future, but I have heard uh, some inklings that this may be uh, two years or less or so, but who knows who's right, who's wrong, only time will tell. So finally, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs either looking to enter the space or who have already entered the space with regard to protecting uh, their intellectual property? It's a great question. I think what I would say is find the sweet spot. And what I mean by that is you don't want to go overboard with trademark filings or other types of filings, but you don't want to not protect your core brands. And so I think the key there is to find a great practitioner that you trust, that is reputable, uh, that knows the space and to, who, who has worked with clients and, and will continue to work with clients in navigating uh, these very, very muddy waters. Uh, the point I think here is that uh, clients or, or prospective clients should just really consider what are my core, what is my core brand or what are my sub brands? What is my budget and can it uh, can I get all of these trademarks now or do I have to wait a few years until the business grows uh, and then secure these secondary trademarks? And I think it's often overlooked that you do have trademark rights just by using. True, it's limited to only the geographic areas where you have used, but it's still better than nothing. And, and so maybe you don't file for 10 trademarks this year, you file for two. Next year, you file for three. And then as your business grows, you, you really protect your core brand. So, so really driving home the point of find the sweet spot of uh, the appropriate amount of protection to really cover uh, your bases uh, without going overboard and blowing the entire budget just on uh, lawyers like myself. <laughs> Jonathan, uh, I want to thank you so much for, for coming on the show, taking your time. I, I know that you are expecting a child any day now. Congratulations. Um, you know, so, so to have you take time out of, you know, this Monday to be on the show is uh, 
pretty great. Uh, can you tell me, tell the listeners where they can find out more about you uh, and uh, your practice at Kenobi Martin? Terrific, Tim. Uh, I want to thank you for having me on the show. It's been uh, very fun. I love talking about uh, the issues that arise here. Uh, and, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, uh, listeners can find me at uh, on my, our website, Kenobi.com. That's K-N-O-B-B-E.com. Uh, again, it's Jonathan Menkes, uh, or they can shoot me an email, uh, jonathan.menkes at kenobi.com. Uh, last name is M-E-N-K-E-S. Uh, hopefully a Google search would, would uh, reveal the name as well because uh, we have written a bit in this space. Uh, and so hopefully my name would, would come up. But uh, I do encourage anyone to, to reach out if they have questions. Uh, we do, I do free consultations uh, over the phone or in person just to see how we can help. And uh, hopefully uh, we have the opportunity to, uh, to work with each other. So again, Tim, thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Jonathan Menkes, California-based trademark attorney with Kenobi Martins. You can find more episodes of the Gontrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of Gontrepreneur.com and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gontrepreneur.com website, you will find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily, along with transcripts of this podcast. You can also download the Gontrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. This episode was engineered by Trim Media House. I've been your host, T.G. Brandfaults.